Let's see. Hello, it says I'm live, but it has said I ain't started yet. That's weird. So, well, I hope I, you guys are all catching me. Very strange. Hmm. Well, let's see. Cool. All right. I'm going to assume I'm going. Welcome again to Philosophy Roulette, number 191, apparently, where we read and review philosophy on air live. You get my reaction, see what happens, and just get some live commentary. So, even though apparently there's glitches in Twitch right now in my stream manager, it does seem like I am live, even though I don't actually understand why, what's going on. But hey, who needs to understand what's going on? That would be crazy to understand what was going on. <laughs> so let's see what's new. Okay, so we've got the American Journal of Industrial Medicine. Well, I don't think I've seen that before, but... Huh, uh, literature. American Ju Journal of Philology. Oh, I guess... Well, in the great tradition, Nietzschean tradition, philologists make good philosophers, so... But I... These look like a bunch of reviews... Let's see. I don't know. Well, I don't actually know if they do much philosophical content, but we'll have to see. So. Let's just see. Like, an epith... Yeah, I just don't know. What is this? All right, let's see. We got the Roman reception of Aristotle. I mean, that does appear to have a philosophical content, so... And you shouldn't really discriminate on uh, where you're getting your philosophy from. If it happens to be the Journal of Philology, that's cool. If not, well, that's okay, too. Classic, uh, Classics and Misogyny in the Digital Age. That's a review by Donna Zuckerberg. Barbarians at the Gate. Let's see what... Herodotus. Bison... And a Persian punishment in Egypt. What could that be? Well, if I can't read it, it doesn't matter. And these are not the right things. So, let's keep going. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about my, uh... You know what? Hopefully this won't break the stream. It shouldn't, but I'm just gonna reload something on the side just so I can actually see if I'm broadcasting. It's very strange to have, like, multiple things. One thing says I am broadcasting and have other things not saying I'm broadcasting, so... It should be okay, but we'll find out. Yeah, I'm gonna not do philology. <laughs> Alright. Annals of Science, I don't read science just because it's too hard to uh, read numbers off the screen and have it understandable. Bioethics, always a favorite of, there's a lot of bioethics published. Yeah, I think I mentioned last uh, stream also, um, like bioethics and uh, business ethics. So these are like boom areas in philosophy, so people should pay them some uh, attention and credit. History of philosophy, let's see what's going on there. Cognition and emotion. Yeah, see, the problem is these things are science-based, consciousness and cognition. Attentional blink. So I guess that would be like blinking a lot. Conscious perception, spatial attention, working memory, encoding. Interesting. Ethics. That is philosophy. Foundations of physics. That's philosophy of science. The CAC ring or the art of making idealizations. Interesting. Here is a business ethics or no, not even business then. General management, so this is more game theory usually. Um, so this is the game, like the theor uh, game theoretic side of business, which is kind of fun too. Like, it's surprising, you get journal of management, but you get like sometimes uh, philosophical content on like game theory and that sort of stuff. Again, not good to read because you're reading, I, I can't read them out, but global ethics, media ethics. All right, so we've got a lot of ethics today. Wish I could... Melvin Fitting, one of my favorite people in the world. Oh my god. Alright, I have to click on this just because. But, um, Mel is a fantastic person. Um, is this it? No, this one here. Uh, he's one of the people I know in New York, and he is wonderful. And I'd be shocked if he actually, if this was not available, it's probably on his website, but. 
Yep, melvinfinning.org. There we go. Is this the right one? Yeah, it looks like a two. A family. Yes, this is the wrong. This one. So we're going to take a quick gander at this. I can all, I can tell you right now that I'm not going to read it because A, I am in no way, shape, or form qualified to read anything on uh, at Mel's level of logic. And also reading all, out all of these uh, numbers and stuff does not make for a good presentation. Um, so you can see like you've got like just sort of formulas embedded in the, uh, in the text. So I mean like... A double bar equals A, um, such that A you like square union B over bar and equals A bar, uh, square intersection B bar or B hat, whatever you were calling that. Yeah, see, this is a, <laughs> I'm sure this is a fantastic, um, yeah, paper, but it is well beyond what I can either under, uh, process in the, the second or read out to you folks so but yeah anyone who is interested in such things should read mel fitting's work because mel is brilliant and besides that he's a good guy so yeah <laughs> i can just imagine trying to read this this sort of a paragraph i don't know how uh, easily it comes up on you it's like c angle bracket l bullseye l comma d cross l <laughs> Uh, look at, the, but he has cool pictures too, isn't that cool? You don't get always, like, so cool pictures in philosophy. I love cool pictures. Uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, word to the wise, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, go read some Malfitting, um, but yeah, this is beyond, uh, my capabilities at the moment. All right, where was I? Yeah, so, general philosophical logic, general symbolic logic also. In the problems, um, aesthetics and philosophy of experience. Ooh, click on that real quick. Mind, click on that. This looks like ethics form. I don't know what this is. I'll click on that. All right, I've got plenty of things to like look at here. Huh. All right, let's get the old search for papers of sufficient length. Uh, let's see, do we have any well-being stuff? Wheel-being, is this, is this like a pun on well-being or wheel-being? Man, I really hope they didn't make an, uh, a typo in the, uh, <laughs> in the title of the, their paper. Uh, okay, so what do we got? This is 13 pages. This is 11 pages. Hmm, let's click on that. Oh, I could handle an 11 page paper right now. Uh, see if we. Hmm. Where is this? Looks like an open access journal, frankly. Where's my little downloady button? This one, probably. Let's just take a look at this and see if it's uh, a potential for it. Alright, so this is a possibility. Um, okay, I like that. Hmm. Alright, so we got one from this journal. This seems like a nice possibility, so we got that there. Let's move over to mind, see what we got in forthcoming in mind. Uh, why is there philosophy of mathematics at all? I mean, there's philosophy of everything. That's a odd question. Uh, human being, bio okay, we got 30. Phenomenal knowledge from class. Oh, there's a review. That's too bad. I always like the sort of uh, different views of like the self, world, and phenomenology from uh, different perspectives. So let's see what else we got. Oh, only one of one match. Okay, so this was the only uh, short enough paper. Let's go back to 2020 then. Let's go look to see what else we've got here. 25. Okay, so review. Let's see what else we have. 
Okay, I think, and this stuff I've looked at before, so nothing much in mind at the moment. The Ethics Forum. Not seen this uh, publication before. Christine Voigt. All right. That's an introduction. It's uh, self-deception, new angles, introduction. Liberalizing self-deception. Okay, so this is something. It's self description It's kind of 15 pages. How long is this one? This is 13 pages. Look real quick at these. Although, I mean, I'll just go do that uh, aesthetics paper. What are the limits of disagreement? 15. Go a little shorter. Mig, mig, Migley at the intersection of animals and environmental ethics. Another 15 page paper. Eth ecocentrism and the sentientism concerning net value. Don't know what that means. Animal and environmental ethics should converge on the following three value judgments. All right, let's go see if some of these things are available. If they are, cool. If not, that's all right, too. Just get some options of what to read. Okay, so that's available. Oh, is this a double page? Okay, no. All right, so this is kind of reasonable. Let's see about this one. Well, if that one was... Uh, available then this one should be available unless that one just happened to be open access Click. yeah 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 thank you internet uh, rules and regulations this one is 17 well you lose to the 15 page paper then um all right let's see what we got conversion it goes did I click on this one already yeah, this is the other one from this journal. We'll find out if this one's any good. And then we'll make a decision soon, because I've been broadcasting for a while without actually reading anything. <laughs> Bangladesh Journal of Bioethics. I mean, for all I know, this is like the best bioethics journal in like the entire world. And I'm just like skipping it. Uh, let's see what this one looks like. Oh, I wonder, is this in English and French? Because, uh, I mean, that would make it twice as long if they're, uh, they're doing English and French on these. No. Okay. So there's 15 pages. All right. So let's take a look real quick on this one. All right. So. Oh, boy. I like this. Four pages. Dignity, community, and albinism in Malawi. Interesting. Ethics, education, contemporary, contemporary. Intimate partner violence in Bangladesh. Oh, interesting. Pharmaceutical promotion in Bangladesh. Okay, so this is really local. What's up, Aristotle? Hope you're having an excellent day today. Thanks for thanks for the lurk. Uh, let's see. Mencius. Always fun. Get one of sixty-eight. Wow. see what's going on at this place yeah, if there's anyone out there has any questions or anything to that effect please let me know I do try to uh, answer questions as I'm going along of course this is my first time reading it too <laughs> I love yeah you know I've been trying to get uh, twitch on my TV for a while I have to fix I have to figure that out but yeah thank you for stop yeah thanks for uh, stopping by and having me on your TV I gotta get myself, like, a fire stick because they, like, discontinued the Roku app, which I find so just irritating and insulting that, like, it's kind of ridiculous because I have a, an old Roku and it just doesn't work anymore. It used to work, but it, or it may have worked at some point, but it doesn't work now. Uh, okay, what do I want to read then? Let's see, what do we got? So I got that aesthetics paper. Okay, nothing in Ethics Journal. Oh, there's no page numbers here. Let's see, Foundations of... Last Cyber Monday, you bought Fire Sticks and Real Grape? Yeah, that's exactly. I might, like, try and go online and buy one cheap or something. Because once you get on Twitch, you kind of, like, it sucks you in. So you start, like, watching other people and you get more involved with the content here. So, all right, we're not going to do science. 
So yeah, I need I kind of want a fire stick now just so that if there's someone on, I don't have to interact, but you know, it's like cool to have it on because they're basically like TV shows. You don't always have to interact. Uh, let's take a look at what we've got here. Nope, nothing there. Journal of Global Ethics. Let's see what's coming forthcoming on global ethics, but I've already got some stuff to look at. Uh, review, discussion, okay, nothing there. In media ethics, that would be kind of cool to see what we got on media ethics. Uh, Alright, example of journalists, codes of ethics in Eth Anglophone West Africa. Media literacy may help address ethical challenges and persistent professional outcry needed. So this is one to two. I wonder what that means. Let's see if it's available. If it's only two pages. See, this is one to two as well. I mean, are these just uh, commentaries? Citations. Okay, so these are all like citations. Okay, so now we got choices. Choices, choices. I've got, is this the well-being trust in society? And this is um, 12 pages, which I like. All right, so we'll do this. I kind of like the idea of a philosophy of experience. And so here's what we're going to do. Well-being, Trust, and Society by Claudia Gina Hassan. I apologize for how I say your name. Oh, I gotta get rid of that. I keep forgetting to just turn off the... Uh... You know what? Let me uh, get this one. If you are interested in the paper, here's the link and you're in chat. Um, you can always come in and type exclamation point paper. Um, and it will, the link will pop back up like this. So if you come in a little bit later, um, I have re-enabled posting links in my chat. So if you have something you want me to take a look at, <laughs> you can now actually post it in my chat and it won't get, uh, banned by the Autobot. <laughs> Anywho. Okay. So we've got Lebensvelt 15. I apologize for my German also. <laughs> I just, I speak English and bad English. I apologize. Okay. Well-being, trust, and society. Introduction. For a long period of time, the concept of trust has not been explicitly analyzed by sociologists or has been analyzed sporadically as part of the social relationship topic. Research concerning trust suffered a strong setback when the focus of studies was directed towards rational choice in the pursuit of interest. Classical sociology has not offered a significant contribution to the topic. Conversely, in the past decades, the topic of trust has been analyzed in depth and not only with a focus on trust in institutions. There is thus a heated debate between the topic and modern society and its reflective ability. R risk society and globalization. Another important branch of studies concerning trust involves cooperation intended as a precondition for development or a production of developed societies. In the following pages, I shall elucidate some of the characteristics of trust related to well-being, but I will also but I will also linger on the concept of mistrust in complex societies meant as a critical basis for change. All right, so this is interesting. It's sort of like a sociological take on trust. All right, so, okay. I'm trying to think if I um, have seen anything on trust in philosophy and I, I agree the only thing I've seen is that like there's like prisoners dilemma sort of discussions on what is the uh, decision theoretic or rationality of um, long like uh, iterated games like how much can you trust someone in an iterated game like uh, prisoners dilemma you should screw them over because you're never going to see them again in like the one shot but if you have like a uh, sort of some sort of trust with the person that like we will coordinate a uh, our actions then you might uh have a different uh strategy but as far as i know it's the only stuff i've seen okay mistrust mistrust studies intertwining research on the individual and the community place trust as a central topic this also occurs in studies strictly related to political context the concept of well-being is influenced by very specific social indicators which refer to that which was called the good life in an ontological sense in classical philosophy Tangible social relationships, which are interested, in, which are instead central in contemporary sociology, especially in terms of trust-mistrust dialectics and the construction of the con concept of identity itself, are instead completely absent or considered very marginally. A's identity is the relationship between A and someone different than A. 
Yeah, I guess so. Self trust would also be yeah. That makes a good point. How much do you trust yourself? And that would relate to a uh, concepts of identity. Like some people always say, well, I can't trust myself. Like say you've got a, an addiction. I can't trust myself around uh, at a casino, or you can't trust yourself around alcohol. And so it's like that would definitely directly go to um your identity and stuff like that. Okay. The concept of trust is central to the state of well-being, whether it is meant from a personal perspective, a system perspective, or an interpersonal perspective, thus at a microsocial or macrosocial level. The topic of trust, which ties into that of social capital as well, presents numerous issues, both in terms of semantic values of the concept and in terms of the possibility or method of measurement. Such concept also gives rise to a number of theoretical, practical, and methodological questions. The intention of this paper is to analyze, in particular, the socio-political and macroeconomic repercussions. As far as pol politics goes, we live in an age of mistrust. Mistrust in the establishment, in the judgments of experts in scientific knowledge, in administrators, and in democratic institutions. We thus face, as citizens, a deep affection crisis, which paves the way for populist forces. While trust is traditionally considered a positive element of social cohesion and community life, one might also interpret mistrust in government as a precondition for democratic control or a completion of democracy, a counter-democracy that in erupts as a balancing force for contemporary democracies. Yeah, well, this is right, and there's also misplaced trust. Wait, 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 did we say that? Um, mistrust, or there's like misplaced trust. So you might even consider the current time as a question of not only what is mistrusted but where misplaced trust would be because uh the internet has or at least we've got a it has one of the big discussions has been how the internet sort of silos people into one area or another and you only get information in the feedback loop so if you're a conservative you only hear conservative news and if you're liberal you only hear liberal news and that means you you end up mistrusting different sources of uh, information and so you may end and you misplacing where you put your trust because if bad sources are mixed in with some of the good sources but that's the only uh area of where you've like trusted your media say like from one sort of a uh, media source say there's like a commentator you really like and then they have most of the time good sources but then they mix in some bad ones then you sort of end up mistrust you have misplaced trust in that uh media commentator and therefore have mistrusted or have misplaced trust in some of the sources so this is really um i wonder if there's a what the placement of trust actually uh amounts to also okay continuing the need to investigate on the topic of trust is enrooted in the deep crisis and erosion of the social foundations of cooperation and civil life, along with a majority, a major identity crisis experienced by Western societies. Therefore, the search of a sense or reason at the basis of social integration represents a strong basis for analysis of trust and its possible new articulations. In an atmosphere of instability and uncertainty, at first in post-industrial society, and currently in globalized postmodern society, the topic of trust acquires new relevance. Surveys are daily bread. Report surveys are, I don't know what that expression means right there. Report a general mistrust that is not well defined in its expressions and at times struggles to have a specific logic. A confidence deficit is recorded at both the macro social and micro social levels. We are living the mistrust heritage derived from democratic societies, and this makes our path, imbued with rising, seeping, or triumphant populisms, arduous. On the other hand, there is a concept of trust certified by abundance of studies and analyses that have decorated it with the status of, funda of fundamental concepts in social science at the crux between psychology, anthropology, and political science. One of the most fertile research currents is the one contemplating a synthesis of collective solidarity and individual self-fulfillment. Hmm, okay. It is agreed in contemporary literature concerning trust that the latter is important to social life and social personal well-being, but the concept of trust is itself is the concept in itself is more debated. Certainly an initial distinction shall be made between studies referring to self-trust, self-perception imbued with trust, and systematic trust. I shall keep these two levels well separated, although they certainly have a reciprocal influence on one another and an extremely strong correlation. I just like make a small comment on this. When you are broadcasting live as I am now, you have to have a certain faith that you're not going to say 
certain really stupid things that you don't mean you're going to say. Like, anyone that is getting, like, live broadcast recorded, I mean, people, like, end up cursing. They say, like, things that are inappropriate. And so you have to have a certain faith in your... If you're going to do a reaction video like me, something live, you can't start going off and saying things that you will get you in a lot of trouble. So... There's a reflective trust going on here as I am reading, trying to process and speak going on that is not so clear to, um, I think, people just watching uh, casually. So, like, I watch um, what's called family-friendly streams, which this is not. You can curse here, and different things might be said that would not be considered family-friendly because this is philosophy, and there's things that are not family-friendly in philosophy, and I don't know when they're going to come up. So I can't call this family friendly, but other people, I mean, even if they say something, even the little bit, the, oh, just a little bit lewd, they get called out. And it's like, so it's, it, you have to have a lot of sort of self-discipline what you're saying, either never curse in your daily life, or at least be able to really, um, have a good level of discipline to keep it completely separate. And it's interesting that this is just a modern thing where we're, everyone's being recorded and so you have to be able to have that level of discipline in this sort of uh, constantly recorded society, especially in Twitch, but also if you're in any sort of public facing uh, uh, profession like policing nowadays where you should expect to be on camera or have a camera on you. So this is a, really an odd, a very new thing, but it's interesting. Okay, continuing. It is a given fact that trust is the key to positive human relationships and, cooper and cooperation, thus life in general, thus its importance is also given. Nevertheless, the conditions making it come about or perish are less assumed. Well, this is like one of these big concepts. I mean, no one defines life nowadays because it's just too hard. But I would think trust is uh, one of those concepts where people just avoid defining it because mostly you're just going to run into problems. So you stick to a more... Uh, an easier topic to actually get a, get your hands around. Continuing. The contemporary sociology context boasts such a large number of empirical researchers that we may nearly go as far as to say that qu the quantity of studies is greater than the real-life expression. There are, in fact, criticalities related to the concepts poly polysemy in common use. We ask the interviewed their d degree of trust without asking them to specify what they mean by trust, which in which causes a confusion of the system level and the personal level in such ideas. I completely agree. We don't even know what we're talking about many times. As mentioned at the start of the paper, the concept of trust is complex and polysemic, thus we may speak of trust in the plural form rather than trust in the singular form. So there's trusts. A comparison between common use of the concept and the paradigms deriving from traditions gives the research an added value. The idea is often conceptualized, especially by Stompka, I apologize for how I say your name, within the theoretical framework of social becoming. Society is a constant process of self-transformation, and this transformation changes structures, personal beliefs, and thus even future practices. The potential for action is the result of a specific fusion of structural conditions and the authority of human actors. As Sartre would put it, we may say that we are able to be within a given set of conditions. I am that which I can become, which decide that which we are to a limited extent, but the space for freedom has a fundamental value. A well-being society avails itself of, of strong level of action, whilst a poorly developed but bad being society has a weak level of action. The strength of an action has to do with the society's infrastructure and resources, some of which are tangible, capital, natural resources, the geopolitical aspect, etc. Yet there are other interesting forces that are intangible, atmosphere, identity, recognition, and very importantly, trust. Beck underlined how the importance which has been assigned to trust as an intangible resource of social action. He claimed that when trust fails, societies waver or even collapse. Gambetta, with his relevant research on the Italian mafia system and trust, claims that when there is total mistrust, cooperation between autonomous social actors will disappear. Such concept, such concept applies perfectly to the mafia, which tends to create a spiral of mistrust among citizens and mistrust towards institutions in order to impose its own system. See Contemporary American Society Now. Even Eisenstadt and Ronin, Roninger 
described trust as a necessary value and basis for the construction of social relationships. This idea was reiterated by a lumen who states that without any form of trust we could not even be able to get out of bed in the morning. We may thus consider trust some sort of indispensable social resource favoring action as well as self-transformation and well-being process within a society. Okay, uh, any viewers out there feel free to ask questions because a lot of stuff just happened here. Like so, what looks like just happened is, um, let me just outline sort of what the structure of this uh, article appears to be. Um, is that we've got like, uh, just trying to get the general uh, understanding of what trust and mistrust is. Like, so what is trust? Like, what is the range of trust that we we normally deal with? This trust, mistrust, and then how does it actually get implemented in society? Here in this section tr uh, two is that it actually um, is a boundary case for what is allowable in like inter how we understand ourselves, what we allow ourselves to do, and then also what it, uh, the society is able to do. Once you lose the trust, then it narrows or widens what um, the options are for either yourself or a society. So it's actually, this is sort of a metaphysics of the abilities of what one might understand of themselves and of society. So, once we do that, then we have, um, so th th this is sort of the groundwork that's being laid here. Okay, continuing. Trust and risk. Trust is an important resource. See, and there's, okay, it is interesting too. So, it's, they're treating it like a resource which allows the society to do certain things or an individual, an agent. Let's just call it an agent. Trust is an important resource and that is available to an agent. And once we, uh, in different sort of, with trust as a resource, you are, can then do other things. So, it's a power in some sense. Trust, an important trust resource required to think, design, and imagine the future, or put more simply, to face it. We act in this view of future events. We study in view of an exam. I trust I will pass it, otherwise I would not perform the action of studying for it. To return to our initial discussion, our actions work in prediction of future events within the limits of given conditions, natural conditions, and social conditions. Yeah, so this is what I was just saying. This reiterates the above point. The risk we are exposed to implies an adaptation to hazardous or threatening conditions. Therefore, the future of society, according to Lumen's idea, has... I hope I'm saying your name right. Lumen's idea has to do with the complexity and uncertainty. From this perspective, trust is an attempt to reduce complexity and diminish uncertainty. Yes, this is the game theoretic perspective here. It's like, how do you uh, mitigate risk? I take certain aspects of the future for granted. Thus, I live as if reality were simple and safe, or in any case... By giving trust, I simplify a reality that, is, that, it, that, if well known in all its aspects, would not help me, but rather would overtake me. Besides, I do not have the power to control everything. Yeah, I mean, if we knew the uh, sun was going to explode tomorrow, we'd all act very differently, but we all just assume that we know the sun isn't going to explode tomorrow. Now, we have no... Now, we have uh, our understanding of physics to sort of rely upon, but we really don't know what's going to happen with the sun tomorrow, and we don't know anything, so if the earth, earth is going to explode, we would act differently, but, um, we don't act that way. What's that movie with uh, Kirsten Dunst, uh, like, Melancholia? Yeah, go watch the movie, it's kind of fun. Lumen explains the essence of trust by means of its ability to generate positive effects. Where there is trust, there are increased possibilities for experience and action. There is an increase in the complexity of the social system and also in the number of possibilities which can be reconciled with its structure because trust constitutes a more effective form of complex reduction, complexity reduction. Its function is to provide the feeling of increased understanding and reduced complexity, which is a central issue in that the individual cannot have a sufficient level of knowledge to not rely upon other individuals involved in the specific fields. Since they are unable to perform certain duties or services on their own, common people are growing reliant upon experts. Seen as semiotics. Glad I was finally online when this was live. Thanks for the great idea. You know, it's very interesting. That's why I broadcasted at a different time today. I was trying to get um, a different uh, group of people. I'm real happy you can catch one. I appreciate you watching. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I started this at what, uh, after, 
Yeah, it was in the afternoon. I don't normally do like just afternoon, like it was 12.30, 12.45 or something. So I was wondering, um, depending on your location, this is still European friendly time, but it's also West Coast um, of the United States, West Coast of the Americas time. Uh, that would be better. Okay. Yeah, feel free to ask questions too. I mean, I'm just reading it. <laughs> Nevertheless, according to Lumen, the act of trusting is not based upon universalistic and general value choices, as Parsons claimed, but on the answers to the societal system and environment of a selective and contingent nature. What are the prerequisites of trust and under what conditions may be they preserved? Sina Semiotic says, I tried doing something similar a few years back and got very discouraged. Nobody would join on some days. Yeah, this is not so easy, and I mean, it's just, um, you have to be doing it. I mean, I didn't do it. I'd like people to watch. I didn't do it because I started off assuming anyone would watch. I already know the, uh, there's limits on internet philosophy in some sense. So this is a form of public philosophy. I mean, this is experimental public philosophy, as I'm consider, uh, consider it. And so it started off as a quarantine project. And I knew that, um, yeah, <laughs> that in some sense it there might it might just flop. But like as far as a quarantine project goes, um, it was okay. And I appreciate that you mentioned my persistence and consistency. That's really the only way I, I know how to get anything done is just to persist and um, be consistent with it. Otherwise, it, that's just the only way I know how to do anything, frankly. I don't get anything done otherwise. <laughs> um, yeah, so continuing. What are the prerequisites of trust under what conditions may they pre be preserved? Vonninger introduced a fundamental distinction, also reiterated by Sampka, between generalized and focalized trust. Such distinctions intersected that between trust in institutions and interpersonal trust. Generalized trust is, above all, that which we think of when reflecting deeply on the allow things allowing us to, to act on the free market. So Dirk and Jaime and preconditional precontractual solidarity as well as that which allows us to ride a bus without thinking it will stop in the middle of the road. Giddens would define this in trust in expert systems. This is kind of what I was saying about uh, the sun exploding too. We sort of trust that there's forces out there that will keep things consistent. So the free market, of course, is just sort of a term of uh, art. It's not so free. There's always things that sort of control it but we have some understanding of the market and how it acts and so even though it's not like completely free we do have some sort of uh understanding of the regularities of it and so we it allows us to act upon the free market because it has regularities same with the bus you understand the bus driver or like i was saying with the physics we understand something of the physics of the sun not exploding tomorrow or at least we think we do okay Therefore, it is a generalized trust in institutions, this expert thing, yeah, expert institutions. So, But the fact that one doesn't think someone may assault them at any moment of their life is also an expression of generalized trust in people, in their capacity as strangers. Generalized trust is, a is anonymous, it is not directed toward someone in particular or someone you know, and Samka clearly highlights how it may fail to exist or be deeply tarnished by the behavior of institution representatives. In any case, such a type of trust is the product of modern and complex societies. It is the result of widespread approval of democratic society and related well-being. This is what normally meant when one talks about trust. When referring to professions, Roniger spoke of focalized, category-based trust. Trust networks, as well as networks of friends and family, members have well-defined limits. They normally do not extend beyond a certain number of network nodes and connections. Moniger's intuition was that the topic of trust owes its importance to the fact that there is a convergence of reflections concerning developed countries and less developed or emerging countries. <coughs> so we've got two levels here. We've got society level connections. We can only deal with so many different countries on a trust level, and the same they're saying that is scaling up from the network of friends and family. Um, I think there was some sort of study that um, people only ever have like 15 close friends or no more than that or something like that. And then it, once you get that, once you try to get above that, like people just don't handle it well. Uh, and so there's some, 
I don't know if it actually is the case, but it does make sense that people want to have at least a minimum number, but there's also a maximum number of people you trust. Otherwise, it gets, um, it doesn't, you know, I don't really know how, how, uh, solid that is, but it, it's, it does seem to, like, uh, maybe just as a sociological fact, how many people, um, you can trust, or just how many people are normally trusted in general by a person, so, and, and maybe the same thing is for society and countries, and that wouldn't actually mean we'd always have to have enemies in terms of, like, countries, which is a little weird, but something to think about. Continuing, in the former, it is recorded that the idea of generalized trust is at risk, a crisis of trust in democratic systems. While in the former, it is recorded that focalized risk with its strength and pervasiveness somehow compensates the inexistence of generalized trust, and at the same time contributes to making it impossible. Cynosemiotic says, part of the problem is that there is a prerequisite for friendship. You have to be able to identify and bond with them. Resource limitations. Absolutely. So what actually goes into it? Like you can't actually spend enough time with enough people. It just gets too much. And so, and, and in any given point, you can only have so many, so much time to spend with people and trust them in so much uh, capacity. And so we have a built-in sort of trust, I guess, with family because we have to spend time with them. But then once we get out of that, we have just a limited sort of uh, time we can spend in general. What's up, DeMarshall? How are you doing? <sighs> okay, so it is... Right. Perhaps this dichotomy is not extremely helpful to distinguishing the sy systems and sometimes the permanence of friend, professional, and family networks as not necessarily a remainder of the past or a lack of modernization. The true theoretical issue is to understand whether focalized, selective, and local trust systems may amal amalgamate and give life to generalized trust systems and how generalized trust conditions tend to degenerate into restricted and focalized conditions. Sampka analyzed Eastern European countries with a great degree of pessimism, but did not describe the functioning mechanism and the incidence of a history of focalized trust in detail. Customized trust relationships were very popular, especially in the economic context that was subject to the bureaucracy of the single party. As for Italy, the most fitting example is what is defined as clientelism, namely the set of reciprocal favors that are more common than the trust we consider normal or generalized. Yeah, this is actually, I think there's a great point right here, is that this is definitely a, there's definitely cultural differences. Certain groups of people will tr treat um, things differently. Because they have a um, sort of an understanding of a reciprocal e economy um, where you've got like uh, you've made deals with this person before. So you've got like uh, not just um, like the social or um, individual level or society level, but then you have like the sort of uh, like I pat your back and you pat my back stuff. So a whole different sort of uh, there might be different ways that people break down the society and then they would have unique kinds of trust that uh, deal with different sort of. Uh, segments. Okay. Another question arises concerning the shift to generalized trust in Western societies. Here we may witness episodes such as the rebirth of ethnic movements boasting selective trust, thus an intra-community trust in the members of the sp specific group. Another phenomena phenomenon features trust turning into a into a good on the market, not in the financial context, but on the online context. Indeed, the likes have a precise economic value. Trust is is promoted just as a product. The key to development of trust and appeal is certainly not charisma, but something quite different. This is going to be, a, this is a, such a big deal. I just saw an article published. It's a online reputation. So reputation goes to all of this stuff. Do you have a reputation? What is your reputation and how do we trust things where we can't meet the people? And then we've got these, all these sort of uh, likes, star ratings and things like that. Um, that go into it, and so this is going to be a massive um, sort of issue. What is your re reputation? One thing that I'm doing here is I build my reputation as someone who reads philosophy. I mean, you don't have to like what I say, but you have to know that maybe I'm not completely crazy when I'm talking about this stuff. I mean, that's basically the grand limit of, I think, what I can be, can be claiming to build here if I'm building my online reputation. Um... I mean, you can publish things in philosophy, you can, like, give talks on philosophy, and basically, that is what you're doing. So how do you actually have likes? 
um, what is the economic value. And this is a universal value because the likes are not specific. They're very generalized. They're completely sort of these abstract internet things, the internet karma, if you will. So basically, this is sort of an internet reputation thing. And so that's kind of this generalized trust can be thought of as a reputation. And reputation is also a concept that does not get explained in philosophy enough. So that's sort of important things going on here. All right, continuing. It is hard to predict what the effect of such promocracy, not seen this word, so it's like the promocracy, will have ungeneralized trust. To trust means to accept a calculated risk that implies the possibility of cross-checking. Otherwise, it is no longer trust but faith. Mm -hmm. How do you trust the online reviews? And most, more and more of online reviews are astroturfed. The behavior of an individual, continuing, the behavior of an individual in the capacity as social actor in relation to the feeling of trust towards the uh, towards other social actors in society itself, viewed in its complexity and entirety, mainly depends upon the answers to local issues he she expects from institutions. Trust is not a consensus of value, but a feeling that arises or fails to arise in the in response to situations strictly related to contingency. It's one of the reasons I have my face on this, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I can't draw my own face here. But this is one of the reasons I have my face up. You want I want you to see that like there's an actual person here that is talking to you. Cuz if you didn't have that it's like some random thing, maybe that that's fine actually in this context because I live or die on my comments on what's going on here. But I want you to see like there's people doing the philosophy. Like it's me. You can see my face. It's not like some old white dude as a philosopher a young white dude basically not that young but like that's the idea like how do you actually get a relation of feeling trust towards the social actors and is the internet in times of quarantine so you actually get to see my face it's like hello out there okay therefore trust has to do with the parts of future generated at future generated at a social level level others exist and i cannot know whether their actions might be favorable to myself or not. The more complex, thus modern, the, a society is, the more such risk increases. Yeah, thank you, semiotics. Doing philosophy requires discussion, and that's what I'm doing. Yep, that's right. There's an engagement, and I have to get feedback, and I am engaging with the text, I'm engaging with chat, and I'm trying to engage with, like, the history of philosophy, or at least discussions with philosophy. So... But again, like I said, I live or die on my commentary, but I want you to see that there's like a person here that, so when I screw up, because I am going to screw up, I want you to see that as like an honest person and it's an honest mistake. I'm not out here trying to, uh, like confuse you here in some sense. I'm not trying to lie to you. I, so how do you generate trust with an audience that you can't see that I may never meet some of you? I know some of you are on in completely different parts of the world. So it's like. You'll never, you may never meet me, but you at least can understand something of me by through the video. So, one tries. Okay, trust is a path to reduce such complexity. If we give trust to someone, it means we invest on that person. Stomka's definition thus comes in handy. Trust is a bet on the future contingent actions of others. This leads us to a zoom in on the field of trust in human actions. In this sense, trust and hope belong to two conceptually different categories. Trust has to do with human actions, and to a certain extent we can have on influence on the latter. Just consider the amazing statement by Simmel, who claims that personal trust activates a social relationship, and when we are given it, it shall be honored. It implies that an almost coercive prejudice, and to let it down requires a positive meanness. Therefore, the act of trust implies the involvement not only of those who trust, but even those who are put trust in, who have the task to prove to be worthy of such trust. At times, though, when the act of trust is deeply disappointed, and those who trust trusted realize their trust was misplaced, the latter may brusquely turn into mistrust. And boy, do you see people on the internet um, give backlash when they thought they trusted a person, then the person does something bad the backlash is hard and it comes fast and so <laughs> yeah that's a, a, an internet thing 
Hope contains an idea of destiny and fate, while trust may be classified as a social action. Trust is our expectation of any result among the actions that others may perform. It is trust in someone else's action. Trust is thus a bet made by the social actor. He or she puts trust in another for the performance of an action. In short, trust is a person's expectation of a certain probability that another's action will be favorable to him or her. Oppositely, if no action if no act of commitment is made, the action falls under a slightly vague category, which is not trust in the strict sense. Broadly speaking, confidence is a concept that is not based upon personal action, but is generic and does not give those who trust any power or, or imply a relationship. All right, I just want to write like this note here. This note right here could be um, taken as you could basically define a formal uh, relationship here in sort of like mathematical or logical terms. So the idea that you can do that um, is actually a positive thing for this paper because once you start defining the formal aspects of this, like you could expectation of probability, this is, you, so you could have like a, a function that starts to describe this sort of thing and then once you start to do that then you could actually start applying it to more and more fields like okay we're going to talk about some stuff but in this uh my reading here i'm talking about the internet a lot which has only been mentioned briefly i guess or as a tangential topic here so this is a really i think a a high quality part of this paper is that it's getting dangerously close to being a formal definition and so, and this is clearly not a formal paper. There's no like math here, but like it looks like it one per, it could be so defined um, that they've got clear enough uh, definitions that they could push it into a, sort of a formal thing, and then they could start doing a logic of trust and a logic of reputation, that sort of thing. And you could get again, like I said, it gets to the game theory, but then maybe there'd be some interesting uh, differences that then they could this person could develop. Okay. There are thus a number of expressions on the various levels of trust. We may assign it to a numerous and different social actors and may assign it with different levels of general generality. A prime example of generalized trust is trust in democracy, a form of trust that provides a kind of ontolo ont eh, ontological safety, a confidence in the continuity of, of self-identity and in the social environment of actions. I don't know if it's trust in democracy, it's a trust in a political movement in some sense. Because, I mean, nowadays we've got, uh, basically, you might say some, like, uh, fascist reoccurrence in society. And why do people do that? Well, people love being part of a grand project. They do. And so they sort of, they may not trust the democracy, but they do trust in sort of being part of an, a social movement. And that's one thing fascism does well. It gets everyone together and we've got, like, this grand uh, history that we're completing that's kind of, like, what you do in fascism and so it forms a trust of a kind of ontological safety that's what's going on in the sort of the fascist mentality it's not that you have a trust in the people which is a democracy it's that you've got your you've got a trust uh in the ontology of like this grand grand history that you guys are moving towards so the continent continuity of our self-identity and that's why a lot of uh fascist fascism goes towards uh like some sort of uh like in you know, like the Aryan self-identity, as it were. <coughs> For better or worse, of course. There's a form of trust that is segmented or addressed to a single sector and not to another. This may also involve institutions. We may trust one institution, but not another. Another important area is technological trust. Yeah, trust on groups, exactly, to Marshall. Nowadays, we could not live without a minimum amount of trust in the technological system we are immersed in, though it was quite mind-laden. We, well, even in the past, we couldn't. I mean, the idea that we're in a special, we've got more technology now, but we were also very dependent on it in the past. I mean, maybe thousands of years ago, it was not, but we still need, like, irrigation and things like that. Such trust has repercussions on products as well. Moreover, po positional trust depends on the, the role a person has and is interested in pr preserving. Trust in people is a completely different matter and depends on the perceived individual competence, reliability, integrity, and generosity. The factors all the above subjects of trust have in common is an action and the effects produced by such an action. Semiotic says, sorry to interrupt again. No, feel free to interrupt. It's kind of fun. Uh, you want to say thanks, got to go, but we'll be a follower, offering encouragement, keep doing these, wave. Well, thank you for, I appreciate it. Um, as you know, it's hard to do, and uh, you, there's no guarantee that uh, other people will like doing, uh, like what you're doing online, so 
You have to just keep doing it. Have a little faith in the uh, rest of the world. <laughs> Trust and politics. What is known as climate of trust or trust mistrust atmosphere, which is which pervades society as a whole and is perceived at various levels, is a different matter. The overall trust atmosphere has grave consequences. A shared trust atmosphere, which manifests itself in all areas of society and goes <laughs> calling. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with philosophy. <laughs> I don't know why I'm always doing this, and goes as far as turning into an expectation of norms, becomes an integral part of cultural systems. Therefore, in presence of a trust or mistrust atmosphere, individuals feel compelled to show a certain trust, mistrust in their relationships that goes beyond our personal inclination. In a perceived atmosphere of trust, culture of suspicion turns into a struggle to speak out, due indeed to the fact that in fact the atmosphere exists on a level that is external to us, which we must always deal with. Thus, the atmosphere as gaseous substance stretches unchallenged from its level to every individual, making both trust and mistrust contagious. Trust seems to have a top-down extinction, while mistrust appears to have a bottom-up extinction. I'm not sure about that, actually. Um, it depends on the form of trust. Maybe it is in politics, but nowadays it seems like we've got a lot of mistrust even coming from the top. In other words, when there is generalized trust, there's trust in institutions and their subsystems. Okay, maybe institutional level top down, but not the government, because our government currently is... I mean, they even say they don't like the media, they like, don't trust these uh, institutions. The more trust there is at higher levels, the easier it will be to spread it. The more consent leaders have, the more they will be, will be able to disseminate trust, while the opposite goes for mistrust. Take the moments of acute crisis, for example, the period of the Tangentopoli scandal in Italy. The, accusi the, the, accuse of, the accusation of co corruption directed towards one or even multiple subjects has led to an apparently irreversible mistrust in the systems, institutions, and everyone, and this caused the said dissemination. There is no right political system, there are no honest politicians, and the politics as a whole is corrupt. This led to, the destruct led to destruction. The corrupt system must die and collapse. This goes to prove how trust is an extremely fragile good. Though questioning the sense to assign such fragility may help to overcome it. Perhaps. Um, yeah, see, there's two kinds. Um, this goes. This is a political theory. Um, basically, when you have only one person at the top, say like a full dictatorship, say you have like full trust and you live in North Korea and you have 100% full trust in Kim Jong-un as your absolute leader. And so there may be distrust everywhere else. Everywhere else is distrusted, but there's absolute faith, faith in Kim Jong-un. And that's just how the society is set up and run. And I'm not even criticizing it at the moment, but see, so the institution is all based in one person. And so I'm not entirely on, like, I'm not, I find this argument here a little bit funky because when you have all, all of the trust based in a person and they are the institution, then the whole government is, like, based in that person's, uh, just in that one person. So you, you still have to trust in that one person. And so this sort of no right political system is based in, it's basically a democratic uh, society problem because the one where there is, there's a lot of distrust in everybody else. The one right political system actually is based on that one person. So I'm not entirely like, I think the point is right here, but like how exactly it's getting argued for is a little funky to me at this moment. Okay. This was done successfully by Rosen Vallon, though he ignored the failures and broken promises of democracy. As Rosen Vallon highlights, it will be the trust citizens have in political leaders that will create control and the need for control, thus making the former more aware and participating. Once again, there is shift in meaning. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about, shift in meaning right here. Rosen Vallon counterpoises a positive conception, counterposes a positive conception of trust to the complaints on the effects of individualism, the fallback on private services, and the decline of politics, with the detachment of the establishment from politics, counter-democracy, which is a participation mode that is not the opposite, but rather a complement of democracy. It is through such civil society that civil society supervises and stimulates institutions, a democracy of organized mistrust, which contrasts that of electoral legitimacy. 
Counter-democracy is thus an integral part of institutions, and by means of control and surveillance, it expands and extends democracy. I mean, there's also mutual le legitimation of, like, crappy institutions. So, like, we have in our, we like to say in the United States that, like, we have multiple equal uh, branches of the government, and they sort of uh, check and balance each other. So, if, like, one gets too strong, it gets checked and balanced by the other one. The problem is, if they're all corrupt, then they all mutually legitimate each other by the same mechanism. <laughs> So instead of them checking and balancing each other, they're mutually supporting their crappy uh, leadership. So, uh, yeah. So it, it's like you're giving life to an organization of mistrust. Yeah. It's like, okay. The erosion of trust as an invisible institution has given life to an organization of mistrust. Or misplaced trust, I would say. Mo uh, Rosenbaum's proposal shall be rightfully included in the democratic approach towards mistrust, which finds expression in three forms, power of surveillance, forms of prohibition, and expression of judgment. Mistrust thus becomes a true political form. Rosenbaum's position is extremely inspiring in its reversal of perspective, but shall be contextualized and understood within the social condi conditions favoring mistrust, well analyzed by Sampka. So that's the thing, it's like if you have this mistrust in the different uh, parts of government, then maybe you can check and balance, but that assumes that they're working properly as a check against uh, overpowering uh, parts of government. Continuing, social gaps and trust gaps in social relationships and political life need to be, fil need to be filled. Thus, a replacement of trust responding to social needs takes the stage. Gidden Giddens defines near mistrust as the feeling of passive expectation and stagnation, the wait for a game-changing event. It is easy to show how, easy to see how. During such wait for a sal salvific event, a substitute of trust comes about and consolidates. Ghettoization with, the, with everything it implies in terms of closure. The lack of general trust is compensated by that towards one's own solid group and turns into xenophobia. By cutting out the external world, people reduce part of the complexity and uncertainty. This phenomenon often results in the search for a strong figure with an iron hand to chase away all our existential fears, and with the ability to reject all that which triggers our mistrust, those who are foreigners, those different to us, when such leaders emerge, they become drive shaft of a blind replacement trust. Okay, and there we got the finally the uh, the kicker. And so the author waited to uh, get their uh, this final point in till the end. So, yep, this is what's going on. But I, like I said earlier, um, this sort of thing, it's not just political. I think this is um, definitely going on within the t technological sphere as well because once you you don't have a like there's no way to just wait for someone on high to get come up with a technological solution to like uh fake reviews and um like what counts as a uh, uh fake news like bad like uh, astroturf news and reviews and all that sort of thing what you do is you end up uh, compensate overcompensating by turning to like certain sources of information and then you trust those sources and and what they say and of course that's very that's a response to having no uh, no generalized way to actually judge what's right and wrong so you have to put your trust in certain sources but then you then have um then you have over reliance on those sources so like say if someone only reads the new york times you will get the new york times view of the world and then of course for all the good and the bad that the new york times is of course they've made mistakes in the past but so has everybody else so it's not just the strong figure with an iron hand it's like the strong um information source in some sense the reputation who has the strongest reputation, and whose reputation do you buy into the most? Okay, so this was a good, fun paper. I quite liked it, actually, because of how, even in their just sort of text here, they still got to this, um, as I was mentioning earlier, a pretty um, specific definitions in this section. Once they were able to do that, then they were able to tie into what would be considered sort of the game theory or social... Uh, social science um, mathematics, you could say, and how that might relate to um, 
different uh, parts of like how all this sort of uh, all the philosophy and their sociology would relate in sort of in, in a technical way just to the theory too to like the other theories all right and then they came in with the sort of nice political point at the end just because that's how the world is at the moment so how is this paper constructed because i do like talking about that well-being trust in society so oh in some sense we didn't get a whole lot of well-being um like how what is self-trust was it to trust yourself but i did like that it was mentioned a bit uh towards the beginning here how do you actually um yeah, the concept of trust in itself is more debated. Like, how do you, what is that discipline to trust in yourself, to know what you're going to say, what you're going to do, that you're going to be okay in certain situations? And then you've got, and then they expand out um, to, yeah, I would have liked, well, I'm personally more interested in, I, I'm personally interested in this sort of thing. Like, what is, like, self-reputation or self-trust? And then we've also got, then we start getting out to risk, which is the technical uh, terms in economics and uh, social risk and political risk. And uh, yeah, so then we've even got like uh, things like that. So it starts off on the personal level, then starts to generalize. And then the uh, DeMarshall, uh, DeMarshall says the legitimizing tech tool itself won't work. Exactly. That's part of... Uh, it's a very bad problem we have. All the tech companies are claiming that they're going to solve the problem with more tech and it's not going to work because it's just not. This is how tech goes is that they're going to make claims. They're going to do it and the tech itself is basically unless it was like a, it just can't. I mean, it's like you're, you're saying that the tech is going to somehow self police itself to get itself right all the time. I mean, that's impossible. How would something always know what the truth is ahead of time? Like, what counts as a quality review? How does the tech know with... Uh, not techno music. How does the tech have information about what product is quality and who's lying? They're not... It's just not going to. It's always going to be after the fact. Um, so, they're trying to figure out based on reputation, but you can... All, the bad actors are always going to be out ahead of that. There's always going to be another... You can always make a new account, in some sense, and scam someone using the new account. All right, so then we've generalized once we got, oh, yeah, I agree, DeMarshall. I mean, even if they had people doing it, the scammers will always be out ahead of, like, people writing reviews because the review is inherently reactionary. You're going to have to react to what's out there, and that's how the tech is going to be, too. And that's in some sense why uh, brand management nowadays, like when you have a famous brand, just say like your Coca-Cola, um, you have to be very careful about your ma your brand management because once your brand gets tarnished, people might start going to Pepsi. But that's what runs out. That's what keeps you in the good graces of like uh, the population is you have your reputation. How much do they trust you as a brand? Once they lose faith in you, they might go to a competitor. But that's part of the problem here you're never going the reputation outpaces the technology it's like what people already knew is going to matter more uh and then whatever you're doing then the technology can only then take what they thought was out there and react to that but if something goes wrong it's always going to be um like if you try to outsource try to figure out what's a good product or not it's always reactionary all right so, and that's the same, there's the same thing with the, pro, uh, well, not the same, and the, okay, and then what happens here is then we go to the politics, and it becomes very difficult. How do you get trust in uh, institutions and politics? And uh, the reputation is much easier to damage than it is to build. So, and that's why you get someone and like, oh, they're doing it bad, they're doing it bad. People forget when they do it right. It's very hard to do things right. It takes a long time, but it's very easy to criticize and knock down. So that's why you get these uh, politicians saying, oh, they're, everything is all bad. Because, well, that's the easy answer. Maybe it's not all bad, but it's just very hard to show when things go right. Because usually when things go right, it's one of those, well, nothing happened. You didn't see anything. I, 
The Marshall says, I just can't believe people mistrust Facebook and Twitter, but they don't question the internet infrastructure itself. Yeah, um, you definitely, the whole setup of the internet, it, you know, there's, there's a huge, like all this technology is often a house of cards. And that's why you get like these outages sometimes. It's like, it's not completely, uh. There's a lot of uh, propaganda put out by the big internet companies themselves to make themselves look better and more impressive than they are be to build their reputation. And that's exactly the same thing as like this political uh, uh, argument here where you might have you, the Apple puts a lot of work to get people to trust in the company Apple. Same with Google. Google has put out a lot of information to get them people to trust google they say oh no we are like the good actors we only present information to you and that's just not true they had a certain way they're presenting the information which um favors them basically it's marketing is it's a quasi government solutions yeah um well we've got these multinational government uh, corporations which basically act as mini governments on unto themselves so that's probably a good way of calling it quasi-government but you know we got multinational corporations and sort of the current uh state of things where if you have enough money you basically can run the government so you're they are sort of pseudo or quasi-governments unto themselves i mean apple's worth what two trillion dollars now i mean you have two trillion dollars you're worth something like two trillion dollars who's really arguing with you i mean you're talking about the united states government and China might argue with you. But, like, that's, like, it. Okay, so, this was a fun article. Um, oh, he meant the sea cables who runs them? Oh, yeah, Facebook just bought a new sea cable, too. So, if you think your information is going to go as fast or have priority over the Facebook information in those cables, you are wrong. I'm sure Facebook says it, it's going to treat all the information the same way. But if they own the cable, I can guarantee you they will be, um, their information will go first. Like, why wouldn't they? That'd be silly. They're paying a lot of money for the C cables. And so who controls what information and, uh, goes through. And basically, you know, if like you have like some sort of video that shows Facebook bad, and you're putting it up on your website, I can guarantee you that Facebook might just question whether they want to serve that uh, video to the rest of the world through their cable. That's the sort of thing that happens. I mean, not to beat on beat up on Facebook uh, specifically, but they, I'm pretty sure, did just pay for an undersea cable. And I can guarantee you that they have... Why would they pay for an undersea cable? If they didn't have uh, business interests in having the undersea cable. And if those business interests are now hurt by that undersea cable, they're going to be unhappy. Okay, so let's save this. Um, oh, closed. Okay, so I think that's it for now. Maybe I could do a second one. No, I'm going to call it for now. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed. If you got any more questions, uh, let me know. But... Otherwise, stay safe out there and uh, have a great day. I appreciate everyone coming by. As Cinesemiotic says, it is very hard to uh, do like internet philosophy. I mean, also Aristotle does internet philosophy. Should give him a shout out. Don't know if Cinesemiotic pu publishes on Twist, but let's see if Aristotle's here. So you can also check out Aristotle for more content. Um. But yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you too, DeMarshall, for stopping by. And have a great and safe day.